you're a successful, successful dude. You got a lot going on. I, I, I get it. I knew this would be difficult, but I'm just glad I got you on now, man. How's your evening going? Uh, good, good. Yours? Not bad, man. I mean, you know, I think we're all kind of dealing with the same thing with quarantine and trying to just stay low, trying to lay, stay low key, but still stay productive, right? Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, sure. that's that's where I'm at, man. But let me let me just quickly introduce myself. So my name is Corey. Um, I, I don't know you personally. This is, you know, first time yeah. we're interacting. But through the bodybuilding community, you see you profiles and connections everywhere. And I started following you when you started going through your journey with the North Americans. And, um, and I started noticing something different with you. And I started these podcasts last year. And my whole thing about doing these podcasts was I like to interview people that are doing things unique, you know, outside of just posting videos of benching and squatting. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I for sure. Something people that had a different niche, and and I had to, I started taking notice. I'm like, this dude is on another level. He's a hybrid type. You know what I mean? Yeah. Number one, you're a phenomenal bodybuilder. You know, I saw that yeah. you you know you won you you won the show in 2014 in Arkansas, 15, 16. You played seventh for North Americans, um, but besides all that, you got this crazy like empire your business of these tanning salons and I'm talking to um you know some folks the other day and I'm like oh this dude I gotta interview him man because number one this is a brother a big black dude look just like me with all these tanning salons <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like and then started doing more and more research and I noticed you know this article talking about how you were a millionaire before 30 I got it I got it so it's a humbling experience to just sit here and talk to you, and I want to hear I everything you got to say, man. Um, st just, you know, introduce yourself and talk about your journey, brother. Yeah, so my name is Ani. Um, live in Arkansas, about to move to, relocate to Dallas. Uh, moved here for college. Um, so really, I don't know how I got into it. Um, I was uh, going to nursing school, so I didn't go to med school. Uh, both my parents are doctors, so it was just kind of just the path that you take. Uh, in my family, and um, my senior year, uh, finals week, I basically decide, you know, I'm gonna quit school. Um, and I was bodybuilding at the time, 21, had an opportunity to purchase um, a uh, Max Muscle supplement store. The lady wanted to get out of it, but I didn't have any money. So basically I convinced her to let me like owners finance it. So she gave me the business um, and I just paid her like $1,500 a month for five years or whatever it was. Um, uh, and uh, paid that back and got another, uh, went to go get another location. Location was too big and decided to, um, you know, essentially figure out what I was gonna do with the rest of that space that I had because the supplement store doesn't need that much space. and. Um, I was gonna do like a fitness studio. What was I gonna do? So I just randomly just like, you know, maybe do a tanning salon. People who, um, you know, the area that I'm in, it's like 3% black, like 90% white. So white people tan. So <clears throat> I was like, you know, people who buy supplements also like to look good, they like to tan, you know, kind of mixes them together. Um, so did like, you know, like a half supplement store, half tanning salon. Tanning took off. Um, and, you know, obviously with supplements, people buy it online and do all that. And, you know, you basically, the margins are not good. So with tanning, tanning being a service, obviously you can make a lot more money. Um, so that's kind of how I started. And then, you know, had, so opened my first lawn in 2010, um, right after I turned 22. And then. Um, wait, wait, so at this point, you're 22 years old. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So I started to open that first salon and then um, open my second one four year, no, five, five years later in 2015. Um, and then since 2015, uh, in the last five years, I probably opened like 30. So just, you know. <laughs> That's amazing, so just, man. Yeah. It's amazing. And I'm sorry that I'm giddy about that stuff, but it's just, you know, number one, I love success. I love successful people. It motivates me. Um, you know, and, and I, and I, you know, I look at your path and it always makes me think, and, you know, I'm okay, but I always think like, man, I need to really push harder. I need to push more forward. Like, 
So it's just, it's just an extremely humbling thing to hear someone's path, such as yourself, at 22 years old, having that type of ownership, being your own boss. You've never had to work for anybody, yeah. um, which is amazing. I'm sure there's some, speak to that. I mean, it, there's got to be some huge sense of like empowerment behind that. Yeah. So, I mean, um, you know, um, I was kind of, you know, I was in Dallas uh, yesterday, went to dinner with my sister and my brother-in-law and I kind of, my sister, she's a lawyer, so she has, a, you know, a law firm in Dallas and then my brother-in-law is a pharmacist, but he works for, um, for another guy. So we we're kind of talking about that and I said something, but it sounded cocky, but I wasn't trying to be cocky about it. I just said, I've, I've been a boss for so long that I don't, you know, I couldn't, I don't even know how to, I don't even know how to, I don't even know how not to be a boss. Like it's yeah. like, it's like, you know, I don't know how to be a worker, you know? So, so to me, if I was a worker, I'd probably be a terrible worker because, you know, I work so hard. If I got to put in a 16, 20 hour day, sometimes to get something done, I get it done, but I'm also doing it for myself. Yeah. You know, it's hard to put a 16 hour day in for somebody else and just hope that, that, you know, one day that they, they might appreciate what you do. And at the end of the year, you get your quarterly review and they give you a 5%, you know, bonus and you're happy about it. Like, nah, like, I'm building, I'm building, you know, wealth and building, um, you know, something. I would rather work for free doing what I'm doing than go and work for somebody else. So, I mean, you know, to, to, um, the, the positive, the, so the, the thing is everybody, you know, always throws out the word entrepreneur, 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 and just like a key phrase, like if somebody says, Oh, what are you doing? Somebody says they're entrepreneur. That means they don't do shit. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, yeah, the benefit, the, the negative about being an entrepreneur is everything falls back on you. There is no, you're the last person to get paid. People see the, because it, you know, Instagram is really like the devil because people see the outward shell. People only show the best parts of themselves. So that's what people are seeing. Yep. Um, you know, whenever, whenever they're, um, uh, you know, looking at, 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 whatever image that somebody's putting out. So they're like, oh, I want to be like this person. I want to do this. I want to do that. And that's obviously nobody is perfect and, and nothing in anybody's life is actually just only positive stuff that they're showing or visualizing. But um, the part that people don't see, like if you follow, you know, Gary Vee or Grant Cardone or any of those type of people, it's like, you know, there was years where they worked, you know, 16 hour days, no recognition, mm -hmm. no money. Other people were getting it. Now that they're successful, they're basically peddling this idea of, hey, you could be just like me if you do X, Y, and Z. If it was that easy, there'd be a million of them right. um, compared to, you know, having whatever that there is. So, so it's not, it's not, um, um, you know, it's not all, it's not, it's, 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 uh, it's a lot more, um, Instagram uh, worthy whenever you're just putting out after the person is there and their success, but people forget the journey that took them there. Um, and, and at the end of the day for, you know, for somebody like me, I said it to, you know, to a friend today. Um, Cause it was like, Hey, do you feel like people take advantage of you? And I'll give anybody anything, you know what I'm saying? So, and it's like, do you feel like, or even like your family or, you know, this person or that person, like, you know, extended family, if I, let them borrow money or do whatever you feel like they take take advantage i'm like i'm like no but if they did i mean that's fine because at the end of the day um i can lose everything i have today and one thing i know how to do is make money so like i don't care so i'm not i don't value money in that sense like i don't hoard mm -hmm. money um at one second man my yeah yeah no problem all right um
My bad. That was Home Depot, and uh, I'm remodeling a store, so the contractor needed to get some stuff or whatever. So yeah, all good, man. So, um, so when I read it, I think you you're actually from like um, Massachusetts or yeah, I'm born in Boston. Boston, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. What made you go to Arkansas? Uh, I had a soccer scholarship. Oh, soccer. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was gonna say football. So, yeah, my my parents are Nigerian, so you know we play we play soccer. I had a soccer scholarship, um, you know, Arkansas, and just uh, played my freshman year, quit, and um, you know I went from running like ten miles a day to not running at all. So you know, got up to you know two thirty, but I've always been like a you know even while I was running eleven miles a day, I was still like two hundred five. Yeah. You know? So then just started lifting. And um, in, in my room, he was not he was my roommate at one point, but this guy that I knew in college or whatever, he was in the bodybuilding. He kind of got me into it. So and that's how I kind of went down that path, and then that led to the store, and then led to the tan salons. And yeah, so, I kind of saw that journey, man. And that, how was that? Uh, you got to work with one of the legends of the sport, Dennis James. How was that? Yeah, now Dennis is great, man. Uh, real down to earth dude. Um, you know, he um, just I mean, cool cat knows his stuff um just just uh you know he's 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 probably underappreciated in the industry honestly um but you know he's because a lot of people feel like you know um it has to be the latest and greatest and all these special techniques and somebody has some new trick and whatever <laughs> and really if we look back at it the old uh bodybuilders really had a better physique than the current, oh, you know, the far. current bodybuilders. Yeah. So, so, you know, the way the dentist does stuff is a little old school, but it's also like mixed in with some of the new science that's, that's out. Um, but not nah, Dennis was great. Best I ever looked. Um, and, and honestly the easiest uh, to get in shape, you know, I used to diet 20 weeks for a show with mm -hmm. Dennis, 12 weeks, you know, good to go. That had and, to be a suffering 12 weeks though, bro. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't, it, you know, it's not even not, I mean, suffering 20 compared to 12, 12 is nothing, you know, yeah. 12, you know, you, you do, you do 12 weeks until a 20, until a 20 week uh, prep and, you know, you're just getting started, <laughs> you know? Right. So um, I was so used to at that point, Dennis was my last coach. So when I did, you know, 12 week preps, it was really kind of nothing. Um, I say nothing, but you know, you're weak, yeah. don't want to do anything, you know, um, just the attitude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and kind of when I look back at it, because I mean, I had uh, when I was when I was doing North North America, I won I won I won the Arkansas two years, fifteen to sixteen, then North America sixteen after winning the Arkansas, and um, I had like I want to say five five stores at the time, um, and when I look back at it, I'm like I don't even know how I did that, <laughs> so. You know, because cause the amount of time and dedication it takes to do the bodybuilding and the amount of time that it takes to run, you know, the business is, is a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So, but yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a nice little journey. Yeah. Now, did you, now did you transition from, um, uh, you just said the name. I don't know why it's, it, 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 I forgot the name now, but now it's, uh, you have it, Mr. O's Nutrition. Which yeah. Is Max Muscle, right? Yeah, it was Max Muscle. Um, Max Muscle is a franchise. Okay. Yeah, so, so Max Muscle's franchise. So transition from Max Muscle to Mister of Nutrition. Okay, and I remember back in the day when I started bodybuilding. I started bodybuilding in two thousand six. Uh, that was when I did my first show. Uh, Jay Cutler, I think, was like one of the first ones to have a Max Muscle store, right? Yep, because it's a California uh, franchise, West Coast franchise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so why, it really wasn't much. Because they, they even had supplements too. Like what? Yeah, they had supplements. It was it's kind of like a, a, it was like complete nutrition before complete nutrition. Yeah, you know, but I, I feel like all the supplement stores. I mean, I don't I don't really keep up with it much anymore. But I feel like um, they are pretty much obsolete at this point. You yeah, know, it's, everything it's, is online. Yeah, vitamin shop, mm -hmm. and GNC, some GNCs, and, and that's really it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, supplement business is a terrible business. Um, you know, it's a million companies, margins are terrible. Um, everybody can just buy online. So, you know, to me, in terms of actual business, it's just a terrible business. And then, and then also people, you know, people want to, part of the reason I was, I continued to bodybuild was because of the supplement store, but I sold, I sold the supplement store the same day that I did North Americans, which was my last show. 
Wow. So once I, so once I sold that, I was just kind of like, all right, cool. I don't need to do this anymore. <laughs> um, you know, not that I didn't enjoy it, but at the same time, um, you know, I'm a businessman. So it, doing amateur shows is not making me any money, yeah. <laughs> you know, right. um, and, and uh, doing, um, and even if I became a pro, the way I looked at it is, you know, I make more than 99% of the pros yeah. right now. Right. So what is, you know, the amount of effort and energy that it takes, and I would be a lower level mediocre pro anyway. Um, so the amount of, you know, energy that it takes to, to do that, I make more money putting that energy into my current business. Yeah. Uh, so it just wasn't, it wasn't something that, you know, made uh, economic sense or that made sense for, you know, if I wanted to take bodybuilding to the next level. Right. That didn't make any sense either because, you know, you know, bodybuilding, you know how it is. I mean, bodybuilding is really just it's genetic slash um, hard work, but but really a lot of people put in hard work and they'll never make it, you know. Right. So it's really, you know, it's a big part of it is genetics. It is. Um, you know, so. And the ones that don't have the genetic makeup, they do a lot of things to their body that they shouldn't be doing that they're going to regret. Oh, for sure. For sure. <laughs> so, well, I mean, and, and they, don't, they don't look good either. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like it doesn't, you know, you just look weird because your your body's not made to to look like that. Right. You know? You're not made to carry that type of muscle. So the, it's the muscle. Yeah, yeah you're, you're wide and you're heavy, but it, it's not, it doesn't even look, you know, appealing to the eye. Right. So it's so not only you doing all that, you're also, you know, you're never going to win anything either. Right. You, know, you don't look it. So. Yeah, yeah no, I was gonna peg me to that question. So I assume like bodybuilding for you is done. Like yeah, know? yeah, yeah. I mean, I probably didn't work out for two years. <laughs> really? Like just yeah. working out? Yeah, not even, not even, not wow. lifting nothing. No, wow. probably work out for two years. I was just burnt out. You know what I'm saying? Just, just, um, you know, it's, it's it, honestly, but what's crazy is I never actually enjoyed working out. So I worked out. I worked out just because I enjoyed the way I looked. But I didn't enjoy the, you know. There's people who enjoy working out. For the most part, those are like powerlifters. Yeah. Right? Um, then there's bodybuilders who, a lot of a lot of times, they enjoy working out because they enjoy the gains that they get from working out. For me, I never enjoyed working out, but I enjoyed the gains. So it was a, you know. So once I figured out, hey, listen, I'm hanging it up. I mean, I'm never gonna, you know. Right now, I'm two seventy five. You know, mm -hmm. I was, I was, uh, when COVID started, I was 298. Wow. Um, so I could stop, completely stop working out. Uh, and I'm, and I'm never going to get below, you know, two, I had to, I had to, you know, fast or not fast, but, but, uh, um, do fasted cardio and, and a, a very strict diet for probably six weeks to get down to 270, uh, 272 mm. during, during this, uh, this whole COVID thing, whatever. So for me, it's like, you know, in terms of a lot of times when people quit bodybuilding, they shrivel up, they go from, you know, 230 to, to 170 and, and yeah. it, hurts, it affects their psyche or their ego because mm -hmm. they're used to seeing them big. For me, I quit working out, I'm still going to be, I still look like a bodybuilder. It's just if I take my shirt off and be softer than I would be, yeah. you know, if I was actually really bodybuilding. But you'll look like so. a normal, a normal big guy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, just look like yeah, exactly. You know, totally not gonna pull my shirt off and have a six pack at two ninety. Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. People yeah. are like, "What's going on?" Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, so it never, it never, you know, the psychological part of it. Cause I think that that's what happens to a lot of people is they're so used to being big. Um, and they, and, and they, you know, they get off to it, or, or, you know, wearing the tight shirts and doing all that. And for me, I was never really like that. I'm just like a, you know, normal guy that, you know, I try to be as normal as possible. You know, I don't do the, you know, lift my lats up or doing that. Just, just, you know, just normal. You see me, yeah. as, you know, just a normal, you know, normal guy. He's like, man, that, that dude's big as hell, but that's, that's really it. It's not, you know, people, people see me out. They, they more. You know, they'll come up and be like, "Who'd you play for?" You know, like I'm play football, I'm not, not like you know, a stereotypical bodybuilder that you know you can eye somebody and know whether or not they're a bodybuilder. Right. And um, I don't like fitting in boxes anyway, so, so I never, um, I never, you know, I never was like that. 
Um, and and for the lifting and all that, I mean, you know, I mean, I'd like to get back into it a little bit. I thought about this, you know, earlier this year, maybe even, you know, doing a show to try to get back in shape and see if I can do it. Um, I'm 32 right now, um, which is still kind of like, you know, bodybuilding pretty much your prime. Um, but uh, but I just don't, you know, I don't think I have the, the time or the, the energy or, yeah. you know, the mental dedication to be able to really, if I do something, I'm going 100%. Um, yeah, and, I, and I think that's the difference. Like I mentor bodybuilders. I help people out, do competitions and stuff like that. And I always tell them when you get to a certain level, because I've done seven national shows. Yeah. I've done about a, a dozen uh, 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 regional shows. And I'm like, when you get to that national level, you know what it takes to get there. Mm -hmm. And before you get through that, before you start that process, since you know what it takes, your, it, your instant reaction is, oh, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna have to do this to get to that point. And that's why it's harder for, for guys like us yeah. to start that back up because we know what it takes to not just be a formidable bodybuilder, but to actually be somebody to walk on stage and win shows. Yeah, for sure. Present for national sure, for packages. Sure. For sure. For sure. Yeah, I mean, and and that's the thing. I mean, if you have, there's a lot of people. I mean, you know, bodybuilding's pretty much been going down for the last ten years or whatever. Um, I've been doing it for, um, you know, probably. I mean, this is actually my office right now. Let me see. Yeah, it's pretty dope. Yeah, it's all, uh, all trophies. Nice. Yeah, like I like I love when they give you the swords, man. That's awesome. Yeah. You got a nice little box. So, you know, I mean, I, I think I did my first one in '09. So, so you know, I've been I've been around it for probably since first started my pr first press in probably 2008. Mm -hmm. So, been 12 years, and I mean, you know, it's um, it's been it's been come so mainstream. Yeah. Um, you know, I think with Instagram, social media, and you know, Killed some it. of the new categories and all that. And I'm not I'm not one of those guys who's like a hater, you know, with you know the categories and all that stuff. But it's become so mainstream that anybody and everybody just thinks they can do it, you know. Yep. Um, so, you know, I'm just, I, you know, for me, I'm, I'm not one of those people who's who going to hop on stage to say, hey, you know, if I get top five, you know, it's going to be, um, you know, I'll be happy with that result. Mm -hmm. If I'm stepping on stage, I'm stepping on stage to try to win. Yeah. Um, you know, I came in 16th in, at USA's uh, probably – 2015 mm -hmm. or, or four, 14, 2014 probably. Um, and uh, I mean, when I stepped on stage, I had the confidence that I was going to win. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm going to ask it, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, right. you know. Them national shows will humble you, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, but at the end of the day, I mean, you have to have that mindset. You have to come in, you have to come in with a mindset. If you, you come in thinking that you, you lost, you already lost, yep. you know. So, so you come up with the mindset, hey, listen, I'm, you know, I'm here to win it. And, you know, you, you obviously weren't the best competitor that day. You didn't look the best. You didn't have, you know, you weren't, you know, you weren't where you need to be. Yeah. And, um, and, I, and pictures look way different than uh, what somebody looks like on stage in person. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah, definitely. you're comparing yourself to last year's winner and everything else. And you think that you're going to, you know, come up and, hey, yeah, I can look better than him. Yeah, you might look better than him in that shot or in that picture right there. But sitting next to him, you look nothing like him. Yep. So, so that's what a lot of people, you know, kind of realize and understand, or, or they get humbled, you know, whatever. But a lot of people nowadays, I guess, they just they're more doing it for, you know, the Instagram, um, yep. you know, photo that they can put up and, yep. and say, hey, you know, I'm doing a show, whatever, compared to actually really trying to win, um, whatever said show that they're in. So, you know, uh. To, to me, you know, that's part of the reason why I, I probably will not ever do it again, um, okay. just because I just know how much work um, it takes to actually get back into that. And I don't, I don't think I have the time or the energy to put, to put back in uh, to right. really, you know, do it and do it I right. It's, it's so different than it was back in 2008, 2009, even 14. Like yeah. You just alluded to a lot of that, man. It's just, it's, it's, you know, I see people on Instagram and I just think to myself, like, who's putting this person in a show? You know what I mean? Who's telling yeah, them yeah. they're good? Like, a lot of females, I help a lot of bikini competitors too, and it's just, they'll send me pictures of, oh, I want to look like this person. And I'm like, 
you want to look like a picture, you know what I mean? So just to the point that you were just making. So yeah, it's definitely a different, it's definitely a different market today with bodybuilding and it's not the same market that I was, that appealed to me when I was back, you know, back in 2007. So no, for sure. I agree there. So let me, let me ask you this though. So I was reading something uh, about your business and something that uh, someone said was, I guess your tanning beds are like next level, like something that is what makes your tanning salons the best. What, what do you feel like has attributed to your success for your tanning salon? Because I also see that you've sold a lot of them too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so basically, um, yeah, I mean, on the beds, uh, I mean, all the beds that buy come from Germany, they're imported. Uh, I mean, these are $40,000 beds, you know? Mm. So, I mean, back in the day, people had $5,000 beds, 20 of them, you know, everybody was was tanning and, you know, people, basically, you made money. You could have a Mexican holding light bulbs and somebody was going to pay them to, to, you know, to get under there. Um, but, you know, now uh, the consumer is a lot smarter. So they don't come as often. Um, you know, they, they uh, want better technology. So, I mean, we have beds that literally you can scan your skin and it'll, it customizes the tan to your skin to make sure it's a healthy... Wow you know, uh, glow. Um, you know, we have a lot of beds that have red light in it, which helps with like collagen production. So a lot of big thing that we do is spa services, um, which actually is healthy for your skin. Um, you know, uh, the beds that we have, we make sure that they're, they're not just tanning beds, uh, because you know, there's a stigma behind some tanning that is dangerous or, yeah. you know, you get skin care. So, so basically we combat that with, you know the the healthier stuff that we that we do have and offer. So, what's your uh, answer to that when people say that when they say about? Well, what I mean, it's not it's not true. One, mm -hmm. um, anything in excess. I mean, it's like saying eating is eating is unhealthy. I mean, if mm -hmm. you eat, you know, twenty thousand calories a day, yes, it's unhealthy. You know, drinking is unhealthy. I mean, I personally don't drink, but you know, I don't know how unhealthy drinking actually is. But if you drink, you know. Um, a gallon a day of alcohol, yeah, you're going to be unhealthy. Yeah. So anything in excess is unhealthy. But the same UV light that you get inside the bed is the same UV light you get when you walk outside the house. Mm. So the only difference is that it's regulated. So would you rather go drink out of a stream or would you rather go drink bottled water? What I'm selling is the bottled water. What you're getting when you go outside is the stream. Yeah. So that's one. Two is if our skin, if you got skin cancer, based on just uh, overexposure uh, to, to UV light or whatever, um, then why don't black people get, you know, all the Africans that are, you know, I mean, my, my family's from Nigeria. We literally live on the equator. It's 90 degrees year round. There's no such thing as a winter, you know, but I, nobody in my family's ever had skin cancer. Mm. Well, do you attribute that to melanin though? Yeah, but, but, but white people have melanin as well. Mm. So, the, the thing is, is that UV light activates your melanin. That's how they get darker when they get in UV light. Gotcha. So the problem is when somebody is basically is, you know, vitamin D deficient, which is caused by lack of UV light, or they never get into the sun or their skin is too pale. When they get in, that's when they burn. Mm. When you burn is when you get skin cancer. Okay. So the reason why black people don't get skin cancer is because they don't really burn because our skin is protected because we have darker skin. Right. So actually the same people who say, oh, if I go tanning, it's gonna cause, it's gonna cause me to get skin cancer. It's the same people who come in to the salon to tan a week before they go on vacation so they don't burn. <laughs> so which one is it? So, you know, you, you, you really, if you tan, you're protecting your skin so it doesn't burn, but then at the same time you go and say that it causes skin cancer. So it doesn't make any sense, you know, so the science behind this is making sense. So, right. um, but mainly it's dermatologists that push that because they, they don't want people to, to go and tan because they have other things. Like there's a shot that you could take and it'll make your skin tan that dermatologists sell. So it's, it goes against their, their, you know, the stuff that they're trying to push and they're trying to sell. So, yeah, you know, it just depends. I mean, you know, you're more, you're more likely to get skin cancer and burn if you're a redhead because your skin is, you know, super pale. But if you come into the salon and, and you go on the right uh, regimen in terms of trying to get, you know, get your skin a little bit darker, that actually protects, you know, a tan is an SPF of six. So it actually will protect you by getting a tan. 
Um, but, you know, back in the day, people also used to go tanning every single day, 30 days, you know, a month. That's not healthy. Yeah. Um, they used to feel like if they didn't burn, they weren't actually getting a tan. That's not healthy. So, so for us, I mean, we, we want people coming in, you know, one time to tan a month, a week. Um, you know, they can so you, regulate, you regulate that. You don't allow people to come. Yeah. Up. I mean, we, 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 we allow them to do whatever they want because they're paying for it, but we, we recommend what they should do. And mm. 99% of the customers do what we recommend. Um, then you have the 1% that are like, I've been doing this for 40 years. You can't tell me anything. And I mean, that, that's fine. Right. Yeah, right. That's, that's the way, that's the reason why you look the way you do, you know? So I mean, you feel like that's what makes you guys different than a lot of the other tanning. tanning yeah. Cause we're not just, we're not a tan we're, we're a sun spa. Uh, so, you know, um, and that's the way we look at ourselves. I mean, we have tanning in our name, but that's the draw that brings people in, but people stay because of the spa services and the other stuff that we offer. When we have people that look like us, that come into the salon, and yeah. they don't come in there, you know, they come in there for, you know, red light because of the skin, you know, uh, benefits or psoriasis or eczema or, you know, whatever. We have, you know, basically uh, things to help treat all that stuff. Yeah. You just see people's face, and I'm sure it's the same for you. When I used to tell them when I would prep for competitions, like, yeah, I got to go hit, I got to go hit the tanning salon. They yeah. You'd be like, what? Tanning salon? Yeah, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Face. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's and that's and that's it. So you know, I mean, people, uh, yeah, people are ignorant to a lot of a lot of stuff. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Yeah, yeah that's that's tremendous, man. So I gotta ask you though. So like, when you think of someone that owns tanning salons, you're definitely you definitely don't fit the criteria physically. Yeah, when you go to these meetings or whatever you do to talk to to people on the business aspect aspect of this. How was that? Like, how was the 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 reaction for people? Do you get like a weird? A weird no, I mean, I'm the only black person who I'm the only black person in America that owns a tanning salon. Like, actually, uh, like like fully owns a tanning salon. Let me let me let me get this right because I'm gonna yeah. highlight this. So you're the only black person in America that owns a chain of tanning salons. One hundred percent on a chain, but also that owns that owns a tanning salon that's not like my wife you know owns one and i'm co-owner with my wife or whatever that actually solely owns you know um salons so i mean there's some there's some guys that you know their their wife is white and she yeah. owns a salon so they you know co-own it but um in the industry um you know i've been featured in you know all the national magazines and stuff like that and then also get asked to talk at the national shows um i think that actually being black is like an advantage um absolutely you know because it's like it's almost like a white running back, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, Christian McCaffrey gets all the love because he's yeah. he, he's different, but I mean, he's also good. Yeah. You know. Right. So, so I mean, if you're if you're good, and 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 you're different, you stand out. Yeah. Um, so you know, and and I always say this. Um, part of the reason why you know I, I get the love that I do within the industry, I think also, or pe- not the love, but the re- part of the reason why people listen to what I have to say. Cause they're like, man, if that black dude can do it, then I know I can. Yeah. And and you could take that one of two ways, right? But but that's but I think that you know that's the way that some of them look at it. If they, hey, if, if he can do it, then then he's successful at doing it. Then I need to know what tricks he has because if he can do it, I know I can do it. Yeah. And there's a, you know because there's a privilege to um, you know basically thinking that anything that you want to do, you 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 feel like you should be better than any other person at at whatever you're doing so well so you had for, to have that mentality to, to to get to where you are right so yeah yeah for sure i mean through hard yeah for sure I, I think i think i don't think anybody's gonna outwork me or if i if i want to you know uh kai says uh thoughts become things i think something like that but that's very true you know you mm-hmm. project or you um you know whatever i want and there's there's nothing that i've ever uh, this sounds really weird or not weird but it sounds kind of like cocky but it's not it's not meant to be but there's nothing that I've ever set a goal for that I've not achieved. Mm. Period. Okay. So, so it's one of those things where it's like, if I decide, hey, this is what I'm gonna do, then I put the work in to get there and do that. It's not one of those things where I just think and I'm just like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna get a private jet, and I'm just gonna sit here and play video games all day, and somehow I'm gonna get a private jet. Now, if I say I'm gonna get a private jet, I'm gonna get a private jet, but it might take me ten years. You know, but that's that's a goal that I set in my mind, and I'm gonna yeah. get 
you know, I'm going to get that. Um, I'm just, I have the work to, to be able to get that, you know? I don't, um, think that does a, I don't think that's a cocky statement because I feel like if you make a goal, the mm -hmm. purpose of a goal is to achieve it. Mm -hmm. if it's not a, if, if you're not, if your purpose isn't to achieve it, then it's just a wish, right? And Herman yeah. Edwards, that, right? So people, but people make goals, pe people make goals for themselves all the time. Like, oh, I'm going to be, you know, I want to be the best rapper in the world and they're trash, right? Right. So, <laughs> so it's like, it's like, you know, what, it's not just the goal. It's, it's also like, what are you doing behind it to, to try to achieve that goal? Um, so it's like a, you know, a thinking of something that's just almost comes off as realistic, but can be, that is realistic. And, and you're, um, and then what are you doing to try to, you know, get yourself closer to what that is that you're, you know, that you're trying to achieve, essentially. Right. So you said you um you're moving to Dallas. Yeah. Is there is there any like strategic reason for that, or is it just like? Um. Yeah. So I mean, my 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 sister and brother in law live there. I have a, I just bought a, a, a you know a salon down there. Um. There the market uh, in that area to me is is pretty much wide open. Um. Also on top of that, my corporate um center is in Oklahoma City. Mm. And where I live at in Arkansas is only a three-hour drive to Oklahoma City. Dallas is also a three-hour drive to Oklahoma City. So I'm able to move to a metro where I can, you know, fly, direct flights. But I also am the same distance I am from corporate um, and also in a market that I want to, you know, that I would like to be in. Yeah. So it just, it just makes more sense. Do you have any other kind of entrepreneurial uh endeavors you know so you did the nutrition store you're not getting back into that yeah um, you destroyed you're destroying the 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 wellness salon market um obviously and i just talking to you now i can tell from your personality that you've already thought five times over about what your your next plans are talk talk some yeah. about that yeah so um you know, I think sticking with what I'm what I'm doing, I mean, you know, was was so two a couple of years ago, 2018, um Palm Beach, who is uh the the largest salon chain in the country, they have probably like five hundred and fifty salons, maybe more than that, they're publicly traded. Um and uh, you know, they came and bought me out of, you know, all of my salons besides two. So at the time and I mean they gave me enough money to uh to basically retire. Um, so, so at the time I was like, you know, what am I gonna do? I, mean, I could put the money like in a money market account or a CD or whatever and just live off the interest um, that it would be it would make. Um, I still had two salons. They wanted to buy those two as well, but they hadn't matured yet. So my my idea was, you know, basically mature the salons to where they're profit, profiting as much as possible, which obviously maximizes the sale price. Um, and, uh, you know, I kind of was going to do that, sell, sell the rest of the salons and figure out what, what, what was my next step? What was I going to do? And, um, after I sold those other ones, I was like, man, you know, I'm going to settle down, you know, got married, you know, had a kid six months ago. At 32. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'm going to settle down, I'm going to relax and, yeah. and, uh, you know, and, and kind of figure out, you know what's next. And then what I realized was I'm like, man, I'm really good at what I do, you know, and, and not only am I good at it, I enjoy it. So, so that's the biggest thing. I mean, there's a lot of stuff, you know, that anybody can be good at, yeah. um, but, but you get at it, you make money, you enjoy it. Why am I going to change? Right. So, so, um, so then I, you know, I have a friend that, you know, owned like eight salons in Oklahoma city. So I told him, Hey, let me buy out half of your salons and, and um did that and then just started just basically open like 12 salons last year and then have another like i don't know i mean i just bought four salons like three weeks ago so mm. five salons five salons like three weeks ago so so um you so know patients that the, the 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 other company bought from you did they they didn't maintain your name they just changed it to theirs like yeah they, they changed it to theirs but they so they had they were my competitor. So they had two locations um, in like one of the towns. I have four. They closed their two locations, consolidated into mine because I had better locations and they just changed the name of their name. So they're keeping your business module though? No, they, they, they kept their, they're just tanning, tanning and tanning. 
So, so they. You I don't know, understand they, that. I don't get. Yeah. That. Well, I mean, they, to honestly, in the industry, to to make good money, you basically need to have a monopoly. Mm. So you know, so for me, when I'm going into different places, I'm going in, I'm trying to buy out everybody. Mm. So I'll go buy out, you know, like I'll go to a place and you know there might be eight competitors. I'll buy every single one of them, and then now I own, you know, say three salons in this town. There used to be, you know, eight or nine. Now all the business is mine, so I mm. I control the market. Um, so that's basically what they were doing. So so it's a, it's a smart play. I mean, and, and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if somebody doesn't offer the same exact thing if that's the only place that they can go. It's, it's, it's kind of like a gym. You know, okay, people, I, I feel like what you presented, and I don't know much, I don't know anything about tennis salons. That's why I do this because I'm learning. Um, but I feel like the, the module that you presented is different than what the others are doing. Yeah. I, if I'm a member of Glow. Yeah, there's, the, yeah people are going to be upset. Yeah. But, but, but what, you, what they try to do is they'll keep some of the stuff for a little bit. And, and make sure that no one else that comes in is using it. And then the old, the people who are still continuing to use it, try to get them off of it. Mm. So then, you know, get it down to where there might only be 5% that are still doing it. And then you pull it. And if that 5% is upset, I mean, one is, hey, you know, we're sorry. But two is, where else are you going to go? You know, <laughs> it's, like, it's like Planet Fitness. Like, if there's no gym in your whole town and Planet Fitness is the only place and they pull out the squat rack, you're going to be upset, but you're still going to go. Right. Because where else are you going to go to? Right, right. You, know, you might put a bad review up or whatever, but you're still going to go to, you know, so so that's basically that's basically what they did. Right. And, and, and I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but, you know, they just, if you don't have competition, you can basically do anything you want. Right. So. And that doesn't bother you, um, someone that's kind of created a, obviously a great brand. That doesn't bother you for someone to come in and just change the platform no nah, i mean every time every time you think about how much it could bother you just kind of look at your bank account and say hey, it <laughs> <laughs> so i mean who cares right uh, yeah. yeah 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 so i mean it's, it's you know i mean if it wasn't like a mutual thing where you know they're paying you uh because i mean i have no intention to sell had no intention to sell if for moving forward i have zero intention to sell no matter how much the money is mm. um and, um, you know, but when somebody comes and offers you something that you can't say no to, then you kind of just, you know, whatever. Who cares what they do with it? They can change it to a fried rice place. I mean, I don't, I don't care. You know? <laughs> Look at your bank account. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. your goal moving forward is to stretch that success that you've had before and just stretch it more, and you're going to kind of corner the market there in Texas? That's that yeah, so, um, so uh, franchising now. Um, so, so I have a couple of franchisees in Ohio, um, uh, have one that just signed up in Alabama, have, uh, uh, some that are signed up in Texas, one in Florida, um, you know, so, so kind of just expanding through them and, um, and then also doing some of my own stories. But at a certain point, you know, I was having this discussion with my sister and my brother-in-law at a certain point it just kind of comes to the point where it's like, how much is enough money? Like, what are you, there's only but so much you can spend. So, you know, cause to me, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to have a hundred million dollars in the bank, you know? So I don't, you know, I'm not trying to die with a hundred million dollars and, and be worried about, you know, whatever. I'm, I'm, I'm more worried about, you know, I want to make sure I take care of my family. Um, I want to make sure that I can do anything that I've, imagine in my head that I want to do I want to be able yeah. to do it money's not a limitation but at the same time at a certain point it's kind of like you make a million bucks a year right it takes you twice the amount of work to make two million dollars right mm -hmm. which doesn't but but if it did why would you do that because what can you do with a million dollars that you can't do with? But what can you do with two million that you can't do with a million? So if you if you made a million dollars year one, and then you go into year two, you make two million dollars. To me, I'm talking, I'm, talking, I'm talking about your take home money. This is the yeah. money that you you're personally making. Yeah. So to me, I look at that as I had success in 2020. Mm -hmm. 2021, 
I made myself more successful. Yeah, but I'm, I'm saying I'm saying if you if you had double the amount of work, so so basically, let's just say you had five stores and, you, yeah. and you're making profiting a million bucks. For you to get two million dollars, you have to have ten stores. Mm. So that's twice the amount of work, twice the amount of profit, twice the amount of money, right? You're a million dollars richer, though. But what are you gonna do with that? That's this is a, this is every year, every yeah. year you're making two million dollars. Right. Every year you're making a million bucks. There's nothing. There's nothing that you can do with two million that you can't do with one. There's a lot that you can do with ten that you can't do with one. But mm -hmm. The difference between one and two is really not that much. So I guess that, right? that lends me to this question, though, and I, this is. I guess I'm kind of seeing where you're going. So then, what's your motivator then? Because it's clearly not money per se. No, no. Um, yeah, money used to be. You know what I'm saying? So money used to be, and I used to care about the the material things. You know, I mean, I was 20. Eight driving a Ferrari, <laughs> you know. Um, so, so I mean, m money used to be, you know, a motivator, and then I just kind of just got to where I just did not care. Like I just, you know, I'm once I got that, you know, once I had millions, of, you know, millions sitting in my account, I was just like, okay, cool, this is nice and all, but you know, now what? Did it make me feel any better about myself? No. Um, you know what? What you know? Okay, what are you what are you doing now? And I I splurred, you know, went to Vegas and you know, you know, making ten, twenty thousand dollar bets. Uh, you know, I bought bought a Bentley and bought a big house and you know did all the stuff uh, for the first you know three or four months, and then I was just kind of like, it's okay, funny. what's what's next? Yeah. So so now what now that you've you've gotten the money that you thought you would never have, okay, what's your next challenge? So for somebody like me, and when I say somebody like me, I mean there's a lot of people like me. Um, but, oh, but there is. Yeah, no, just you know, in terms of in terms of just the in terms of just like the the psyche, the thinking of like the setting the goals, you know, when, when you when you have when you have when you have, you know, when you're setting a goal and you're thinking to yourself and you're saying, okay, cool, like, all right, so I want to make you know a million bucks. Okay, cool, you make that. The problem, the my biggest issue that I have, is the art of fulfillment. I've not mastered that yet. So my wife is very just like um, content in a sense. Like when I say content, I'm not saying like, not not in a bad way, but like she can, hey, this is my goal. I achieve it. I'm good. Let me, I'm going to enjoy that goal and be content with where I'm at at this moment, right? And for me, it's like, all right, my goal is, like my current goal right now it's it's a far ways away but but it's my goal is, is is a private jet and it's like okay i i can get that jet and then for three months i'm happy and after that i'm like i don't even want this no more mm. i'm not so it's like you worked 10 years to get this jet and then after those 10 years, when you got it, and you're like, it's not even 10 months later, and you're like, man, this doesn't, this doesn't even satisfy me. Yeah. It doesn't make me happy. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So so it's like, it's like you work so hard, so every single day you're working, you're grinding, you know, and this is just the way my wife looks at it. Every single day you're working, you're grinding, you're not giving me, you know, the time that I deserve and, you know, whatever else, because I have these goals in my mind, and I don't let anybody get in front of my goal. And you're doing all this stuff and whatever. And then when you finally do reach the goal, you're not even happy. So it's like, that's a big, that's probably my biggest issue is the art of fulfillment. It's, it's, it's being able to set the goal, achieve the goal, and then be happy when you make the goal rather than constantly be looking at what is the next thing that you're going to do? What is the next goal? The part of what makes somebody like myself successful is the, is, is that problem that you have because if you just set a goal and you say okay i just want to make a million dollars a year well when i made a million dollars a year then i'm just kind of like all right cool that's my goal and then i'm just i'm just going to continue to do what i was doing to get there and i'm never mm -hmm. doing anything else but the fact that once you get that first goal then you're never satisfied is the reason why you're always looking to achieve more but this but but the flip side of that that is also a problem you feel what i'm saying i do i'm following you 
Yeah. So the same, the same thing that makes you successful is the same thing that also is a detriment to yourself and the people around you because they're looking they're like, okay, so what is, you know, like I said, what's next? Well, yeah. you know, what's going to make you happy? Like you're never satisfied. Um, you know, so. So yeah. you're, on a, you're on a continued pursuit to fulfillment. Yeah. I mean, I'm trying to figure it out on, on what that, on what that, you know, what, um, on how to on how to to get there, but I, I think I'm I think I'm definitely getting better. Um, I assume I assume you're not like because you got you got I'm sure you got an awesome house, you got a beautiful wife, kid. So that stuff's different, right? Because a lot of people aspire to get there. So mm-hmm. you're moving that that's separate from like what you're what you're referring to, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but that was part of it at the time. Mm-hmm. Cause like, hey, you know, I'm gonna settle down. You know, it's just like you know, I'm telling my wife. She says this all the time. You know. You know, you lied to me. You know, she jokes around and says it. You know, she tell people the story like, oh, he, when we met, he said he's ready to settle down, have a family. He's made all the money he needs to make. And then it's like, you know, we get together the second that we, you know, settle down. I'm like, boom, on to the next one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you buy all these stores and then you're like, once I get these set up and get, get the operation where I need to go, then, you know, we're going to be good. And the second that that happens and I go buy another four stores or another six stores, you know? Yeah. It's like, at this point, she's like, every time you, every time you buy a store, does your wife go, does she give you one? I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, depend, you know, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, she, she, she's, she's supportive and encouraging, but, you know, at the same time, it's like, you know, kind of like, Hey, you know, you just keep lying. Because, yeah. but, I, but I'm not, I'm not actually lying. Like lying would be, I'm, what I said was not true. But I believed it to be true when I said it. Yeah. So, you know, but but my problem is I can't pass up opportunity. Right. So, but, but you know, now what I was saying earlier was when I was saying the one million, the two million was exactly that. It's like how do that's that psyche of what I was trying to explain is what I'm training myself to do, which is like not everything, not more is not always better. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, so being able to say, okay, yeah, this is an opportunity, but how does that actually better, you know, my situation, my life, you know, whatever, you know, my brother-in-law asked a really good question. He said, okay, so, you know, how many states you guys in now? I'm like seven. He's like, oh yeah, sooner or later, you'll be in like all 50. Is that, is that the goal? And I said, you know, I don't really have an ego and, and people, people understand what ego means. You know what I'm saying? A lot of things I've said in this, you know, podcast have probably come off as if I do, but I really don't. Um, when I do things, my motivation is not how I feel or my ego. So I don't use my ego as a guiding force. Everybody has a little bit of ego, but I really kind of shut that off, yeah. consciously shut off my ego. I said- like People that are successful understand what you're saying and how you're saying it. Yeah. If aren't successful, so, may not understand it, and they could take it the wrong way. For sure. So, so you know, I, I told him, I said, if you, you take ego out of the equation, why would you want to be in all 50 states? Mm-hmm. He said, I guess you're right, only to say that you're in all 50 states. <laughs> I was like, because if, you, if you're making enough money in 20 states, then why do you care to be in all 50 states? Well, what's enough money, though, right? Enough money is, is, is the money to be able to do anything you want to do. But you can probably already do whatever you want to do now, right? I can't buy a private jet. <laughs> <laughs> so, so i mean you know yeah. that, i mean I, I can fly private if i want but that's not yeah. that's not buying a private jet um so it's you know if, if i if i look at something and i say ah, i really can't afford then i don't have enough money but 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 when i'm when i'm saying have enough money it's you know for me um i don't hoard money i don't value money like that but have enough money is being able to take care of my parents, even though my parents can take care of themselves. Mm-hmm. Being able to take care of my, my my wife's family, being able to to do anything I want to do for my friends. If I if I want to go and fly, you know, all my friends to, you know, an island and rent out, you know, whatever, I want to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. And money is not a motivating factor on whether or not I can do that. So I can enjoy my life however I want to enjoy my life. That's that's enough money. But how much, how much is that? Right. Like how much, you know, because for you, you might say, you know, how much is enough money? You might say, you know, 
I'm making a million bucks a year. Oh, that's enough money for me. You know, you might say that, you know, um, uh, but anything that, you know, anytime you're looking at something, you're like, because I'm actually pretty frugal at the same time. Um, but I've come to the point now, like there's certain things like food because I dieted for so long. I don't care if I love seafood. I don't care if it's $500. If I want to eat it, I'm going to eat it, you know, <laughs> because it's just, I work too hard to be sitting over here penny pinching mm. on certain things. Um, so it's like, you know, for some people it might be a pair of shoes. I just don't value clothes and, and, and shoes and stuff like that, you know, like that. I, I haven't probably bought myself any clothing item in years. My wife buys it, you know, you know, cheap shops for me all the time. But I, if it was up to me, I'd be wearing the same thing that, you know, I was wearing 2016. Yeah. Because that's just not something that I value. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but if it was something I value, there's you know, if I value shoes, I'm a sneakerhead or whatever, and I'm and I'm making money, I don't ever want to go look at a pair of shoes and say, you know what, I probably shouldn't buy that because I can't afford it. Mm. So, so that to me is where it comes, and we can judge. Okay, well, how much money is enough money? It's it's really being able to do anything that you want to do. Um, you know, that you want to do without money being a restriction. But one thing you also, or people will also realize is when you have the money, a lot of things that you think are valuable, like if you had $20 million in the bank, a female, like she wouldn't go buy a Birkin bag because mm -hmm. you wouldn't care. You only care about buying a Birkin bag because you don't have the money mm -hmm. and you want other people to think that you have the money. <laughs> yeah. When you actually have the money, you'll realize that you don't care if other people think you have the money, you know? Right, right. I was faking until I made it until I actually made it. Right. <laughs> now, now I don't care, you That's know? What most people do. Yeah. So, you know, you just don't, you, you don't care anymore, right. you know? So, so you're not going to spend the money on, on the frivolous nonsense. You know, it's, it's more, um, you know, on, on, uh, you know, your family or vacations or memories or, you know, things that you can actually really truly value. Right. Uh, you know, not worried about keeping up with the Joneses, you know, when you're actually making the money. Right. And let me ask you this. So you've been doing this for a long time, obviously successful. Um, to me, the key to being successful is making smart, uh, smart business decisions. What, what's attributed to your ability to make smart business decisions? What kind of decisions that you've made throughout your time to like keep you successful? Because I see a lot of people that, start like you and then they don't last long because they don't make smart sound business decisions so it goes back to the thing where i said i don't i don't have an ego or i don't make decisions with ego um i never think i'm right mm. period so so when i say i don't ever think i'm right i'm not saying that i was going to to that i always think i'm wrong in a sense if i'm having a discussion and somebody says hey you know I think X, Y, and Z, um, and we should do this. I'm going to say, no, nah, I think, you know, I think this. But, and that's because we're having a discussion on what we think is the best path to take forward. Now, if I have a decision that I have to make personally as the CEO of the company, I never make a decision without consulting other people. I <laughs> never make a decision without coming at it as if my position is wrong. I want to get to the right position. My, my vision can be right. I want to say, well, but, you know, I'm playing devil's advocate with myself to make sure. So, so I'm impulsive. Um, so I make quick decisions. But at the same time, I don't make decisions um, that are on my own to where they're not thought out or I think that I'm the smartest person in the room. When you think you're the smartest person in the room, you probably need to get out that room. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So, right. So, it's, else yeah. So, so it's one of those things where, for me, when it comes to making smart business decisions, it's just always coming from the aspect of, you know, I'm probably, um, you know, I'm probably wrong, and I need to figure out. I'm searching for the truth compared to, um, you know, hey, I'm right, and I need to convince everybody else that I'm right. I'm, I'm looking more like, hey, what do you think about X, Y, and Z? You tell me your thoughts. I'll go tell somebody else. I won't even tell you my position. Yeah. And and whatever they tell might be illuminating based, you know, to something 
it might it might shed light on something that I didn't even think about, or it can confirm the decision that I already had in my head of what I was going to potentially do before they said anything. Mm. So, so that that's how that's how you know I typically make decisions. And so you want to be challenged. You want to be challenged on those decisions. Yeah, love constructive criticism. I, I don't like yes men. Mm. So so love constructive criticism. You know, and and always want to make sure to approach something as if, hey, let me let me prove this right. And and the other thing is, when you have a team, and one thing I will say about myself, I'm a very strong leader in the sense of I can can pretty much convince anybody to do anything, but it's for for the good. I had, took a personality test and it said, um, or. Uh, my COO of the company, having she's into all the personality tests and all that stuff. She had me take a personality test. She said, you know, she read back the results and said one of them said, you can convince anybody of anything for the good. And um, like I'm a manipulator in a sense, but like in a positive way. Yep. And um, and, and I kind of embraced that. And, and kind of, I didn't, you know, I never actually saw that on paper or actually really claimed that. Until she said that, I was like, "Hey, listen, I'll claim that I'm not. I'm not really worried about it." But part of the reason why I could convince people or get people on board or get people to basically follow me almost blindly is because of the fact that I get buy-in from my team. I don't like calling people my staff; they're they're my team. You know, mm -hmm. I get buy-in from my team because there's nothing that comes across that I get to say. Hey, this is how we're going to do it now. I need you guys to figure it out. No. Before a decision is made, what do you guys think about X, Y, and Z, or what should we do about this? And they were in on making that decision when it was made. So when it comes time to implement that decision, they're 100% bought in because of the fact that I brought them in on the decision-making process. By bringing them in on the decision-making process, if you, if you can't convince somebody of what you believe, then you're probably wrong. Yeah. Mm. You know what I'm saying? You know, so 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 that that's the philosophy that I have. So if somebody comes to me and says, you know, hey, I think we should do X, Y, and Z, and I disagree, if I can't convince you otherwise, then I'm probably wrong. Yeah. Um and and, and I have yet to see where I'm right and have not been able to convince somebody. Yeah. So yeah. all of your business decisions are collective ideas usually. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I don't make any decisions on my own. Because I don't think I'm the smartest person, you know? So it's just, you know, it's a collect, like smart people surround themselves with smart, with smarter people, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so, so, and, and that's, and that's really it. Um, yeah. you know, and if I, and if I don't, if I don't have anybody in my team that has the expertise on, on, you know, how to do it, I'll, I'll source, uh, to, you know, a, a firm, a consulting firm, or reach out to people that I know that are in those fields that are better, you know, just hire like a, a new marketing director. And I really didn't know how to do it. So I reached out to one of my friends that's like the head of PR for, you know, a really big company. Another one of my friends that's consults for marketing and, and got both of their opinions, paid one of them to usher us through the whole interview process and all that. And the hire was amazing. Yeah. Compared to if I just think, hey, you know what? I know what I'm doing. I'm smart. I'll figure it out. Probably would have hired the wrong person and, you know, would have been stuck in a situation where I have to fire somebody or figure out a way to get rid of them. Now we're back to square one, trying to figure something else out. So instead, you know, just approach it where, hey, you know what? I probably don't know what I'm doing. So let me figure out somebody who does um, and, and kind of go from there, you know? Okay. So you, with, with speaking to smart business decisions, I'll pivot to this a little bit. You told me earlier you went, got to your senior year at U University of Arkansas, and then you dropped out of school. Mm -hmm. I assume at that point you had a vision. You were like, all right, I'm not doing this, and I'm, I can only imagine what your parents thought at the time. Yeah. But what was, your, what was your thought process going into that? So you said, I'm going to stop going to school, and then there was something else that had to resonate in your mind. Tell, tell me what happened there. Yeah, so um, so basically, uh, you know, the opportunity just came with the store and it just, you know, some life changes, you know, one life changing event 
along with the opportunity with the store was just kind of like, you know, let me just try something different. Mm-hmm. And, um, and let me see if I can really do this. Cause I never thought I never, I've never taken a business class a day in my life. So, so I, you know, I never, um, you know, sat down and was like, Oh, you know what? I really want to be a businessman. Like I never, you know, I never actually really thought about myself that way or that I could do it or I wanted to do it. Or I had a vision to do it. That wasn't just, it wasn't anything that was on my mind. So whenever I just, I, I think I kind of, for, for the business, I kind of looked at it more from a bodybuilding aspect and say, you know, I'm kind of, you know, I came in third in my weight class. This is back when I was like 21. Came in third in my weight class in Arkansas. People know who I am locally. So, you know, they'll come buy supplements from me, you know, whatever, which, you know, I was an idiot and <laughs> was mistaken because, you know, the people who know you are the ones who won't even support you. It's the people who don't know you who actually even show you more support. Yes, sir. Um, so, so, you know, that, that was really what happened. And then I got stuck into a situation where I had no choice but to succeed. Because sometimes you put yourself in a situation, it's almost like if you put yourself in a, you know, hey, my goal is to, is to jump 10 feet, you know, just straight 10 feet. Um, if you put yourself in a situation where you were on a, you know, a moat and, some, and something was coming to come get you, you would probably jump the 10 feet. Because you know it's either you jump the 10 feet or you die. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So in that situation, it's like, I'm stuck. I have to either find a way to pay this lady because I can't just back out and say, hey, you know what? I just changed my mind. Find a way to pay this lady back or make it make it work. So just made it work. And, and, and you know, do I even know how I made it work? No. It's just, you know, when we get to situations, we just have to, we have to perform. And, yeah and try to excel at whatever we're doing at that time. So it just, it just happened. It just happened to, to work out. I, I, you know, it's probably a little like humble to say it just happened to work out as if it wasn't a lot of hard work or whatever, but I get you it. know what I'm saying? It just, I definitely you know, get it. Did you yeah. grow the business? I assume you, you grew the business. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Probably 300%. Yeah. Um, you know, so I mean, yeah, it, it took off. Um, so, I mean, she was probably doing, I don't know, ten, twelve thousand dollars a month. Uh, you know, rents like thirty five hundred bucks, and she worked the store half the time, and then you know her son or something. So labor was low. Uh, supplements, you know, you have the, you're probably looking at five thousand bucks. So she's probably making a couple thousand bucks a month. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, my first month I was at I made thirty thousand. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, and out of the thirty thousand, probably. You know, twelve twelve thousand of that's probably you know profit or something. So I'm making more profit than she was making in revenue. You know, the previous months when she when she was there. So, so yeah, we grew the business, but you know, I mean, ultimately, at that time, I thought that was you know big boy money, and, yeah. and you know, hey, let me go do another one or whatever, and and uh, and then that obviously led to the tanning situation, and and then you know started to actually see real money. Um, and uh, just realize with the supplement stuff, it's just, you know, it's not, um, it's not worth, it wasn't worth anything. I mean, you're, you're going, you know, you'll go to, uh, to, to uh, Harps or I don't know if you have Harps where you're at, but, you know, Harps sells uh, optimal nutrition and you'll see like amino armor or something like that. They're selling it for less than what you pay for it at your wholesale cost yeah. for your distributor. So it's like, you know, as a as a consumer, I'm not going to go and buy my stuff just to support small business or black business or whatever, or, you know, female business or whatever somebody wants to say, whatever hashtag they want to use. It doesn't make any sense for my pocket for me to go and spend $30 on something that I can go to the the grocery store and go pay $20 for. Right, right. And at the same time, even me selling it at thirty dollars doesn't make any sense, because if I'm paying twenty two dollars for it, I'm making eight dollars. Eight dollars is not actually money made. I have to pay labor. I have to pay bills. I have to yeah. pay rent. $3. So, so it doesn't make any sense for the consumer. It doesn't make any sense for for the retailer 
either. So that's why supplements just didn't really make any, you know, financial sense because, you know, people can go buy it online. Distributors were, you know, basically you could cut out the middleman who is the retailer. And if you can cut out the middleman, I can give, I'm selling it to the retailer for, you know, $20. $20. I can sell it to the consumer for $22. Yeah, make more money off the consumer, cut out the retailer, and and uh, you know so it doesn't really make any sense on on either way. So that's that's pretty much what ended up happening. Every you know, everything got accelerated back when I got into it in two thousand and and uh, nine. We didn't use the internet as much. We still used it. Now, uh, we still used it, but we didn't use it. I mean, back then, I, I want to say Amazon was just selling books. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> so right. we didn't we didn't use it as much as as we do now, but you know, as everything has continued to go that way, um, you know, supplements uh, has basically you know become like essentially obsolete. You ever of, um, you ever walk into a GNC or a vitamin shop of late? A vitamin shop, uh, yes. What's your first? What's your thought process when you walk into them? <laughs> um, how do they make money? <laughs> yeah, you know. But then, I mean, I see the prices. I know what they, you know, they get better prices than what I used to get, but they're, but it's we're still probably 10%, you know. Yeah. Um, so I look, I mean, I look at the prices and I'm like, you know, I, I kind of know what they're making off of it, but, but it's still, I mean, just if you look, if you go into a vitamin shop, how much inventory do you think that they have in there? Cost. So is it inventory cost on the floor? Yeah. Just, Ten grand, twenty grand, no, no. less probably than that. Right, fifty. Fifty? Yeah. Okay. I don't. I don't know. So, you, so you're looking at fifty grand that's just sitting there. And if they, some of those things, if somebody doesn't buy it, you have. That's why there's always a clearance rack. Mm-hmm. If somebody doesn't buy it and it comes close to that that date, you basically have to sell it for what you paid for it. Yeah. And I go and I'm buying stuff off of clearance. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to the clearance rack. So you're looking at it and you're saying, okay, cool. If uh, 20 people come in that day, 15 of them buy something, let's say they're making 100% margins on it. Vitamin shop is always in a prime location. So their rent's probably 8,000 bucks. Yeah. Labor, you know, everything else. How many things of protein do you have to sell to pay your rent? Mm. Pay- it just doesn't make, you know, it, it doesn't really make any sense unless you have a monopoly. Like in, in, uh, in where I live, I think there's only, there might be a GM, maybe, I don't even know where it's at, but, or maybe it's, I think it's in the mall. Actually. But, but the but vitamin shop is basically the only thing, you know, so, so they probably made good money, but like, it doesn't make any sense when, you know, you have Mr. Mm-hmm. O, you have vitamin shop, you have, you know, another local place, you have GNC. Yeah. There's not, uh, there's not any money to be made, you know, in that in that market. Um, there is enough money to be made for a one retailer, because for people like me and you, when we need something, Yang, sometimes you don't have four days to wait. No. For it to, for it to come. So you're willing to pay twice as much to get it like now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so there is a little room for for a retailer in the market, but you know, there's not there's not a, you have to have a monopoly to actually try to really make money doing. It. Right. When I walk into him, I, um, cause I, I actually used to I'll tell you a quick story. So when I was in college, I had a friend who was like a regional manager for a bunch of GNCs and, um, he took over a territory and he was like, I just got to get guys that are into working out. He's like, I don't care if you have ever had any selling experience ever. He's like, I'll teach you about the products. Just come in there, stand there, talk about the products. People are going to buy them from you because of the way you look. Mm-hmm. They're going to take your advice because they look at you and they're going to say, all right, if that guy does that, that's what I'm going to buy. So the first thing I think of when I walk into him now, and that's how it used to be back in the day, like 10 years ago, you had a little mean longer than that. You had a guy that was into fitness, into working out, that was selling these products, consulting people on these products. Now you walk in, you see guys that are working like Hot Topic and, then, you know, that's no diss to them or whatever, but... <laughs> It's like who's oh, yeah, for sure. from this person? You know what I mean? For sure. And 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 uh, you know that that reminded me. People people would always say, "Man, why'd you get into tenant?" I'm like, you know, one reason is because of what I told you, which was just the having the extra space. But but the yeah. other thing is, I had Mr. O's, I had tanning salons, I had a I had a limo company, 
I had a marketing agency and I had a laser hair removal company. I had all of them at the same time. And um, I have a mentor and he said, you can be a slave to many and master of none. Basically saying, listen, pick one and run with that, right? Yeah. I ended up picking the tanning out of, you know, I had the supplement and the tanning for a while and then ended up just going full fledged with the with tanning. But, um, you know, I always said I would work behind the, ta- the counter at the tanning salon 20 times more than I would work behind the counter at the, at the supplement store. And the reason why is because the tanning salon was a challenge because I would tell, I would even tell the girls, I said, and no one could outsell me when it came to tanning. <laughs> I told him, I said, if I'm able to sell this, you should be able to sell it 20 times more. Yeah. One is I'm, I'm a man, even if I was a white man, Still 90% a man. of our, our demographic is females. Yeah. They don't want to, they want to buy from another female. Right. Then I'm a black man, so they know I'm not even using the product <laughs> that I'm selling them. So I said, you guys can use a personal testimony. You've never used it before, but you can say, oh, I love this, blah, blah, and you've never even used it. They're going to say, you know, I want to look like her. Right. right? When I go to Mr. O's and I'm working, I can sell anything without saying one word. All I got to do, I can say, buy this, piss in the cup, mix it and drink it. And they'll say, okay, you know, <laughs> because they want to look like you, yeah. you know? So yeah. they, they want whatever secret, you know, because people don't, don't think that it's just hard work, you know, mm-hmm. for the most part. So it's like whatever secret supplement that you're taking, you know, tell me what I need to buy so I can look like you. And it's like, you could buy everything in the store. You still ain't going to look, <laughs> you know, like that. Um, but to me, the challenge of selling tanning was, was, was enjoyable because it's something I shouldn't be able to do compared to the challenge of supplements where you didn't have to do anything. You know, you just, Hey, do this, do this, do this. And they're like, okay. It was you very know. easy. Yeah, yeah. I never, I found it so easy, dude. I, I, yeah. I mean, that's just the way, cause you know, people, you know, you're, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know. It's like somebody has 50 piercings and you go to get your ears pierced. You know, you're going to probably listen to that person. Yeah. When you go to Best Buy, you, you respect and listen to what the person who's working says because they're the expert. Right. So, you know, so when you're selling supplements to your bodybuilder, hey, he's probably taking 100 of these. So I need to listen to him on, hey, which one's the best one for me to take? What they don't know is you could be getting a spliff on selling them this product <laughs> versus this product. Right. You know, it could be the same thing, but this one costs more. Of course. You know, it's the same exact thing, but you're making money off of that. Or this one's even better. Or this one's worse than the other one, but you're still selling them that one just because of the fact that, hey, you're making more money off of that. Like, you know, who knows? Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's just business and the way that, you know, the way that it works.